Hi Raptor fans! My name is Teresa and I work here at the Montana Raptor Conservation Center here in Bozeman, Montana. And I have with me one of our education ambassadors. His name is Chaco. And we are going to talk about Chaco today and a few other raptors. And we're going to focus on <coughs> raptor tools. And Chaco is going to talk about it a little bit too. So raptors are hunting birds, they're birds of prey. And so in order to find their prey, catch and kill their prey, and eat their prey, they all have very specific tools. There's a lot of variety in raptor species, and a lot of that has to do with the area, also the area that they're found, also the type of food, <coughs> type of food that they eat. Uh, now, a lot of raptors have very excellent vision, hooked upper beaks, and strong feet with sharp talons. But there are some raptors that have various uh, differences in these three main characteristics. So not all of them look the same. In fact, most of them look very, very different from one another. In fact, there are some, vult uh, some raptors like the palm nut vulture over in Africa that don't have very sharp talons. In fact, the palm nut vulture's diet consists about 90% of palm nut fruits. So they really don't need those sharp talons with strong grips since they're not going to be killing most of their prey that they eat. They're mostly going to be eating those palm nuts. <laughs> Chaco's getting some snacks of meat while he's out here to give him positive reinforcement. <coughs> and apparently it's going to make him call a little bit more. He's excited. <laughs> now, raptors from all across the world have a lot of differences about them. There are three main groups involving raptors, the falcon, falconformes, which are the falcons and a few other raptor species, and then the occipitriformes, which are going to be hawks and eagles and old world vultures, and then there are the strigiformes, which are owls, typically. Here you go, Jack. You want another piece? <laughs> Now, Chaco here is going to be our first raptor that we're going to talk about, those main characteristics. And hawks definitely put the eye in eyesight. They have amazing vision. A lot of times people will get called hawkeye, and that is definitely a compliment. That means you can see really well. I do not have very good vision, so nobody ever calls me hawkeye. <laughs> but hawks especially have amazing vision. You can see Chaco looking way off in the distance. To give you an example, if Chaco and I were looking about a mile away, which is like 17 football fields stacked across from each other, uh, Chaco could see a lot, and I could see a lot too, but I'm going to be seeing trees and bushes with not a lot of great detail, maybe see some cars, but with hawks, especially hawks like Swainson's hawks, like Chaco here, or red-tailed hawks, they could see a rabbit a mile away, and not only see that rabbit, but they could see it in such great detail, they could see the sides of its chest moving in and out as it breathes. So they definitely have amazing eyesight. Diurnal raptors, or raptors that hunt primarily during the daytime hours, have a high density of cone photoreceptors in their eyes. Some large raptors, like the wedge-tailed eagle from Australia or some old world vultures from Africa, Asia, and Europe, have uh, visual acuities almost twice as high as humans. And part of their great depth perception that they have and part of that keen vision is because their eyes are forward facing. So you can see Chaco's eyes are more on the side of his head than like an owl, but they're still very forward facing. So that's gonna give them a great binocular field of view, which is where both of your eyes can see something at the same time. So raptors that pursue prey actually have two fovias, and fovias are the, is that area where you can see uh, more focus and have more clear vision. Um, now one fovea, fovea is a deep central fovea and is going to help them probably see their, dis their prey a long distance away. It's going to give them excellent dis distance vision and they're going to have very accurate lateral field of view. There is another fovea, which is a, a little bit more shallow than the other one. It's the temporal fovea, and that allows for sharp vision in the front of these birds. So they have very specific adaptations in their eyes that are going to really help them find their prey. <laughs> now, 
these guys, like hawks and eagles, they have very intense orbital ridges, which you can see on Chaco. It's kind of like a big eyebrow bone sticking out over their eyes. And that's going to really help protect their eyes from the sunlight. So when they're soaring um, through big open fields, especially for Swainson's hawks, or if they're perched on top of a pole, that will help block the sun from their eyes, just like wearing a hat would help block the sun. But also it can give them a bit of a blind spot, especially for birds like eagles. Um, golden eagles and bald eagles have very large orbital ridges and that's gonna help them with sunlight. But also when they're soaring and they're looking down at the ground, that will block their vision from what's in front of them. So it can be hard for them to see things when they're looking down at their prey on the ground when they're soaring. But it'll really help keep their eyes safe from the sunlight, give them excellent vision. Now another thing, another tool that hawks definitely utilize is their camouflage. Now if you look at Chaco, you might be like, what is he going to blend in? Now those nice brown colorations on his belly and on his back, those are going to help him blend into open fields for sure. But what's really important with a lot of hawks is they have what's called counter shading. So their bellies are a lot lighter than their backs. I'm going to turn Chaco for a hot second so you can see he's got a much darker back than he does uh, have coloration on his belly. That was a good turn. You want a piece? So when he's soaring over the open fields, that dark gray coloration of his back is going to help him to blend in if there's maybe some predators soaring above him, like a big eagle. That'll help Chaco to blend in. And then his light belly is actually going to blend in a little bit better with the sky. So if he's soaring over an open field, his prey might not see him as well because he's got that nice light belly. Now hawks obviously have a lot of amazing things about them, but those are some of their really um, amazing characteristics and raptor tools that they will be using out in the wild. Now Chaco here has been with us for about 19 years. He is 19 years old this year. We got him when he was a fledgling learning how to fly in Great Falls. And it turns out we did an x-ray of him and found that his left humerus had not formed correctly. So he's never been able to fly, but he is a wonderful bird to have as an education ambassador. If you have any questions about Chaco or Swainson's Hawks, please leave them in the comments below. Okay. Hi everybody, here is Prairie, and she is our very chatty short-eared owl. Now when I say short-eared owl, you're probably looking for those short ears that her name is talking about, but short-eared owls actually typically don't have their little feather tufts up. They're usually right in the middle of their forehead, and they're very small, but they're not her ears. They're just tufts of feathers. Those are called plumicorns, and those short little Plumicorns are what give short-eared owls their names, but she usually doesn't have her feather tufts up unless there's like a predator nearby or she's just caught her food. That's usually when her feather tufts will go up. Uh, those feather tufts might help her blend into her environment, give her a little extra camouflage. You'll see it on birds like long-eared owls, which have much longer feather tufts, or uh, great horn owls, which their plumicorns look almost like horns. So that's how they get their names, but they're just tufts of feathers. Now owls have amazing raptor tools. When you look at owls like great horn owls, snowy owls, and even little prairie over here, you can see they have really large eyes, especially compared to the size of their skull. Owls' eyes actually make up about 3% of their body weight, whereas most humans, our eyes only make up 0.0003% of our body weights. So our eyes are quite a bit smaller compared to the rest of our body than owl's eyes. Now having large eyes lets in a lot of light and that'll help with a lot of owls that are hunting at night that are nocturnal or owls that are hunting at dusk that are crepuscular. Another thing that helps with having big eyes is having a long, uh, long tubular shape to their eyes. That's gonna give them extra focal length and what will happen is that will create a larger retinal view giving them excellent visual ac acuity. Now these birds have many many densely packed retinal rods which are uh, photoreceptors that work really well in low dim lighting. Excellent for birds that are hunting by just a little bit of light. Now uh, they actually have about a million retinal rods 
per square millimeter in their eye. Humans have about 200,000 retinal rods per square millimeter in our eyes, if that gives you an idea of how many these birds have. Like most birds of prey, owls' eyes are forward-facing, especially owls, they have them almost on the very front of their face, and that gives them a large range of binocular vision. Remember, binocular vision is when they are viewing something out of both eyes at the same time. An owl's field of view, for instance, is about 110 degrees with just their eyes, and about 64% of that is binocular vision. A sparrow's, on the other hand, has a much larger field of view at about 30 or 300 degrees, but their binocular, binocular vision is very, very small. They only have about 10% of binocular vision. So their binocular vision is going to be very helpful with depth perception. That's going to allow these birds to find their prey, strike them with lots of accuracy, making them excellent at catching and killing their prey. Now, they have incredible long distance vision, and but they are unable to see things close up as well as they can far away. So when they catch their prey, they actually typically close their eyes when they reach down to eat it, not only because they can't see it very well anyways, but also this will help to protect their eyes if whatever they have caught is trying to fight back. Also, owls have special little bristly feathers around their beak and you can kind of see when prairie turns to the side a little bit or when you there you go those are kind of like whiskery little feathers that stick out and those actually allow her to feel her prey with those little whiskery feathers and they actually stick out even more than you can probably see on the video they've got tiny little black feathers that stick out even further and they look a lot like cat whiskers and that's going to help them to feel their prey now, owls' sight is extremely impressive. They also have an amazing adaptation um, that's called the tepidum lucidum, and a lot of nighttime animals has, have this as well. You've probably even seen it on your cats or dogs at home. If you ever shine a light on their eyes or if you've been driving and seen a deer at night, they all have that kind of grayish, greenish sheen coming off of their eyes. And that's from the tapetum lucidum, which means lucid tapestry. It's an extra layer of cells in their eyes that helps to reflect extra light, keeping their light in their eyes a little bit longer, giving them excellent vision at night. So even though they have all those densely packed retinal rods, the tapetum lucidum is something that is extremely helpful for nighttime hunters. Now, their eyesight, obviously amazing, but owls also have amazing hearing. A really good way to tell you're looking at an owl is by the round shape of their face. You can see on Prairie, she's got a very round face. That's called their facial disc. It's made up of thick bristly feathers and allows them to funnel sound back to her ears. Now I know she doesn't have those uh, ears sticking out of her head like her name suggests, but her ears are underneath her feathers. They're right on the edge of their facial disc, one on either side, just like ours but they actually have asymmetrical eyes. So one's down here and one's up here, a lot of times in a lot of owls, and that allows them to triangulate where the sound is coming from. So they can pinpoint exactly where they're hearing the sound just by using their amazing, amazing hearing. And this is extremely important for birds like great gray owls, great horn owls that are hunting oftentimes in uh, snowy times so they can't see their prey or also birds that are extremely nocturnal just like great gray owls and barn owls that often hunt in almost complete darkness they utilize their hearing now a barn owl can actually hear a, a mouse's footsteps about 90 feet away a great gray owl can find a mouse underneath a layer of snow so they obviously definitely utilize their hearing. Now Prairie here is going to use her hearing quite a bit, especially to help her out with predators. You can see she's not a very large species of owl, so she's going to need to be able to hear things from a long ways away that might be interested in catching her. So her striped camouflage is going to help her out, but also her hearing will help keep her alert. You can see she's looking all over the place just to make sure there aren't any predators nearby. Even though she's making lots of noise, it would obviously be very easy for a predator to find her right now. Now, owls not only can find their prey really well, but they're really excellent at catching and killing their prey. If you look at Prairie's feet here, you can see they're very fluffy. 
So she's going to have uh, basically homegrown wool socks on her feet, which will help keep her warm in the winter time. You can also see she's got two toes in front, and she has, it's kind of hard to see, but she has two toes in back. Owls have this special toe on the outside right here that they can actually switch to the front of their foot or to the back of their foot. So right, right now she has what's called an isodactyl toe arrangement. The two toes in front, two toes in back, which are going to help her perch a little bit better, help her grab onto a glove or help her grab onto a branch. But when they are catching and killing their prey, they will go ahead and flip that outer toe right here a little bit more to the front, which will give them what's called, or I'm sorry, this is called a zygodactyl toe arrangement, two toes in front, two toes in back. And then they flip the third one to the front, and that is an isodactyl toe arrangement. I got those two a little mixed up. Oh, right now, she sees a raptor way off in the distance. It's so far away that I can't even tell what it is. It might be an osprey, but do you see? It's hard to see, but you can see her little tufts going up and her face gets very contorted. So she can move her feathers around uh, to maybe look a little more camouflaged. So you can see those little tufts going up. That's a really great example. Good, good job flying by there, Osprey. But as soon as it's out of, out of sight, her tufts start going back down. So it must be a little bit more of an alert, something that'll help her hide in the grass, maybe alert other short-eared owls near her that there's a raptor nearby, something that she might wanna hide from. I got off topic. Oh, so, so she right now has a zygodactyl toe arrangement, which will help her perch. And then the isodactyl toe arrangement is three toes in front, one toe in back. And that will help get their hallux, that very back talon, to help them catch and kill their prey. This girl right here is going to be a really good vole hunter. So she's going to really utilize that isodactyl toe arrangement to catch and kill those voles. And then she can actually swallow a whole vole say that 10 times fast, swallow a whole bowl right down the hatch and not have any issues at all. But that is just the tip of the iceberg with these birds. They are amazing raptors, but that's some of the really amazing raptor tools that they use in the wild. If you have any questions about prairie, short-eared owls, or owls in general, please put them in the comments below. Okay, everybody, here is our last raptor ambassador for you all to see today. Now, this here is Millie, and a lot of you probably recognize her right off the bat. She is a peregrine falcon, the fastest animal in the world. These birds highly rely on their amazing raptor tools to help them out in the wild. They are so specifically built to catch up to their main prey item, which is other birds that they have very amazing adaptations that you can see on them. Now one thing you might notice right off the bat is that Miss Millie here has very big eyes, so she needs to have amazing eyesight, <clears throat> which you might have noticed is a very common theme with a lot of the raptors that you've met here today. She has huge eyes that's going to allow her to see her prey from a long ways away. But one thing you might notice that's different from her uh, versus Chaco is that she does not have large orbital ridges sticking out over her eyes. Instead, she actually has these things around her eyes called sclerotic wing rings, which most raptors have. And these little bony rings actually allow raptors to protect their eyes, keep their eyes into in their skull, and for falcons especially, it's really important with them to have these sclerotic rings help them uh, keep their eyes safe while they're diving. Uh, owls actually have sclerotic rings that go entirely around their eyes and keep their eyes in place. But as you can see, as Millie is looking around, she can move her eyes around in her socket just a little bit, whereas owls are not able to. So her sclerotic rings do not hold her eyes in place, but they are very important for protecting her eyes. She does have a little bit of an orbital ridge, which is going to also help her when she's diving. Now these birds reach their amazing speeds of over 200 miles an hour on their steep dives. So what they'll do is they'll go way up high in the sky, they'll come down in that steep dive called a stoop, and that's where they tuck their wings in. Falcons have very stiff feathers that are pointed and their face and their body is extremely aerodynamic, which is going to allow them to reach really, really fast speeds. And then what they'll do is they'll put their ball up their toes, their long, thin toes, into a fist. And at the last second, they'll whip out their feet. That'll slow them down a little bit and they'll punch their prey 
right out of the sky. They can even wrap those toes around their prey and eat it while they're flying, which is the coolest form of fast food ever, right? It's extra fast food. Those long toes, instead of being able to crush their prey like a lot of raptors, uh, great horned owls have a PSI of about 250 pounds of pressure per square inch of squeezing power, whereas most humans don't even get over 100 pounds of pressure. But Miss Millie here isn't going to have as much strength. Instead, those long, thin toes are going to allow her to wrap her toes around her prey's chest. Now, you can also see that she does have some nice hooked talons on the end of those toes, and that's going to also allow her to get an excellent grip on her prey. You can see that she has amazing camouflage on her belly, lots of spots and stripes, and those are going to allow her to blend in, especially in rocky areas. Most falcons, peregrine falcons, are going to be nesting on the edge of cliffs, um, but you can actually see them nesting sometimes on the tops of skyscrapers, but her camouflage is really going to help her blend into rocky areas. Another thing that helps with her amazing vision are those dark stripes you can see underneath her eyes. Those are called Maller stripes and those are really going to help out just like football players and baseball players when they put black underneath their eyes That is going to absorb sunlight and keep it from reflecting back into their eyes So same with those football players and baseball players her Maller stripes are really going to help her have excellent vision while she's flying and help block the Sun even though she doesn't have those big orbital ridges so her long, thin toes are going to be really useful for grabbing onto her prey, and then her beak is specifically built for killing her play, prey. Most raptors kill their prey with their feet, but falcons have special notches. They're on either side of their beak. They kind of look like vampire, vampire teeth sticking out, but these notches are really going to help her kill her prey. When she clamps down with her beak, it's going to actually sever her prey's spinal cord very effortlessly and kill her prey exceptionally quickly, especially if they haven't died from that initial hit from them hitting them at those fast speeds. Now imagine sticking out your head out of a fast moving vehicle and trying to breathe. We've all done that before. It can be really difficult to breathe. Now imagine you're doing that out of a car going 200 miles an hour. I don't know if I would be able to breathe. It would be pretty tough. We'd probably stick our heads right back in the car. Now, Miss Millie here, she's not able to do that, right? So she has to still be able to breathe when she's diving at those super fast speeds. So falcons actually have these special little bony tubercles that are inside of their nares or their nostrils. And those are gonna allow uh, her to break up the air pressure around her nares and give her excellent breathing ability while she's diving at those super fast speeds. So really fast animals, really fast birds are gonna be built quite a bit differently than the slower, more um, agile, or slower, more, slower hunting birds like owls. Owls you might have seen with Prairie, she was kind of sitting a little more forward, whereas you can see Miss Millie here is sitting up very straight. She has a different body build than owls and also than she does with hawks. Now these super fast birds are amazing to have in your area. If you ever get to see one, it is quite a treat to see them out in the wild. If you have any questions about Millie and her amazing raptor tools, please let us know in the comments below. Otherwise, we hope we taught you today that not all tools are drills and saws and hammers, but instead are very, very different for raptors and they all are amazingly built and adapted to their environment and to catching the type of prey they're supposed to catch. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your day. Bye!